How many of you feel like the Lord's coming after you today? <laughs> Sometimes when you come in and you sit down in the sanctuary, the best description for what starts happening to you is, oh my goodness, I'm being pursued by the Lord. And that's a good thing, believe me. I mean, I, I guarantee you, whatever it is that's going on in your life, you want him pursuing you, right? Yeah, the conviction of God, the strength of God, the power of God, the move of God in your life just signifies that the Holy Spirit is just uh, moving in your life. The Bible describes the love of God being without reproach, which simply means that the love of God is never ashamed. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yeah. Because if there was anything in this world that we could guarantee, it is that God should be ashamed of us. Now think about that. You said you'd never do it again. You said, I'll never talk like that again. You said, I'll never do some of those things I used to do. You said, I'm not going to be the same person, but you did it anyway, didn't you? <laughs> and you've been ashamed of yourself. I know you have because I've been ashamed of myself. But according to the scripture, God's love can never be ashamed of us. His grace can never be ashamed, and it's never ashamed, which is one of the reasons why it's amazing. We talk about the amazing grace of God. Why is it amazing? Well, it's amazing because it has properties that are not like human properties that can be shamed and rebuked and, and, uh, and, and, and beat down. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just so glad that God is never ashamed of me because he has plenty of reasons to be. I guarantee you. But he pursues us and he loves us and he challenges us and he moves in us. And he never shames us and, you know, uh, beats us into submission. He's always moving to change our lives, to move us forward, to move us up, to make us better, to challenge us to be greater. And that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, he's going to get you today. <laughs> he's going to get you today, yeah. Yeah, he's going to get you today, yeah. And just go ahead and surrender right now. I mean, avoid the rush, right? <laughs> Avoid the rush. Surrender early. <laughs> That'll be the best thing for you to do because he does have some things he wants to say to your heart and challenge your heart in. That's what the book of Revelation is all about, by the way. I know that many of you have been with us. This is what, uh, on the top of your outline that I gave you to take notes on, it says this is number 17, right? Well, that means there have been 17, at least 17 messages. I think the first the number one study sheet you had, I, 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 it took me two, maybe three weeks to do it. <laughs> I think many of the others are right on cue, you know, the right number, but number one probably took two or three weeks. But, but anyway, the point is we've been here a long time already, right? <laughs> I mean, 17 weeks in a row we've been in the book of Revelation, and we've, we're moving along at a masterful pace. We're already halfway through the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, and there are only 22 chapters. So, you know, we just have a few more months, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, by the time Christ comes, we might get finished with the book of Revelation. You know? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. If, if, if we don't get finished with it down here, when, when he takes you on home, uh, nobody's going to have to finish it for you. <laughs> All right, that's right. You uh, it'll be complete in your mind because the book of Corinthians, if you haven't read it in a while, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, and now we see through a glass darkly. Yeah. Yeah. It means we see through a, a, a very dark, I know many of you have your automobile glass, which, you know, as you get older, it gets worse for all of us older people to see through that kind of stuff. But you young people, you have stuff so dark, you, nobody can see <laughs> They can't see who's driving or anything. You might come by and wave at me, and then you say, man, pastor's so stuck up, he didn't even wave. Well, I couldn't see, who I, who, I couldn't see that you were waving at me. I couldn't tell you who was driving the thing. And the Bible says we see through life like that now. We see through a glass darkly. That's the way life is. It's, there are things that we can't see that don't make sense to us. But then Corinthians goes on to say, but when we shall behold him... Everybody say the rapture. Everybody say calling home. Yeah. But when we shall see him face to face, then we shall know as we are known. 
So what is it that God knows about us? He knows everything, right? So what is that verse saying? When we see him, now on earth we're walking around and we don't see everything and we can't understand everything and it doesn't make sense to us. And I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus this, you know. And when I may I say respectfully to you, and I'm not trying to insult you, but when you get to heaven, you're not going to ask Jesus anything. You know why? Because you're going to know it. That's right. You're not going to have to ask him everything because the Bible says when I get to heaven, I'm going to know as I'm known, which God knows everything about me. So when I get to heaven, I'm going to know everything just like God does. It's going to be just supernaturally revealed to a resurrected mind, a new mind, a new body, and I'm going to know everything I need to know. So praise the Lord. That's what awaits us. Well, the book of Revelation is about revealing Jesus Christ. And I know that might sound a little unusual because most people that look at the book of Revelation think the book of Revelation's intent is to reveal these bizarre things that go on at the end of the world. And even though it does re reveal things that are mind-blowing, and you'll begin to see them now, we've, we've gotten into the, we're in the breaking of the seals, and then there's the blowing of the trumpets, and then there's the pouring out of the vials. Most of the activity of the book of Revelation is carried by uh, a series of seals being broken and trumpets being blown and vials being poured out. Most of the book, the action is carried by one after another. These things beginning to uh, be, will happen and they're catastrophic in the way they happen. In every one, things just get worse and worse. And you might be thinking right now, man, it is terrible. It couldn't get any worse than this. So I say to you, it's going to get much worse than this. It's going to be really tremendous. And the Lord wants us to know what, li what lies in wait for the future, even though I believe we'll be gone. I believe the Scripture teaches we'll be gone. Uh, at some point before all these catastrophically terrible things happen, but the intent of the book of Revelation, according to the book of Revelation, the very first verse the book says, let me tell you what this book is about. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not the revelation of mystical things. Not the revelation of scary stuff. Not the revelation of these weirdo events. But this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what we should look for in the book is how does this book reveal Jesus to us? In all of these events, what is Jesus all about? What is Jesus doing? How does Jesus play in these things? He's our Messiah. He's our Savior. He, he, he has come to dwell through his Holy Spirit in our hearts. So how is he related to all of these things that happen in the future? Let me show you how Jesus relates to all this so that you can be strengthened to know that he's a worthy savior, he's a wonderful deliverer, he's a true judge of all of these things, and that God is not foolish, God is not unrighteous, God is true in his justice and his judgment, and that Jesus Christ is worthy to be the king of our life because he's involved in everything that happens in the future of this old crazy, crazy world that you have to admit doesn't make a bit of sense to us now. When we look at how wicked this world is, when we look at how catastrophically bad this world is, it's hard to imagine that it could get worse or that the injustice and the lunacy of the age we're living in is righteous at all, and it's not. Uh, you know, I, that's one reason why I believe in heaven and hell, because I believe that there has to be justice somewhere in this universe. Well, we're not living in it right now. Because the, the, more, the more unrighteous you are, the seemingly better you do. Uh, we have people preaching philosophies and putting forth agendas on this earth that have nothing to do with God and seem to be crazy in their, in their fulfillments, and they just seem to be doing better and better, and, and there seems to be no judgment, no justice, no, no call, and all of that kind of stuff. Well, let me just tell you, there is one day... Uh, look at your neighbor and say, uh, you're going to get your comeuppance. <laughs> you're going to get your comeuppance, yeah. Yeah, your comeuppance are on the way. 
because the justice of God is going to prevail on this earth. There's a payday someday if you want to look at it that way. Yeah, a payday someday. Just like when you use your credit card and you put thousands on there and you think, oh my goodness, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get away with it. No, 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 no. There's a bill that comes to you at the end somewhere. That's right. It doesn't hurt right now because you're not feeling it. But one of these days, they're going to come take your TV back. They're going you know, to come repossess your automobile. You're going to be in a restaurant and all of a sudden look out the window and it's gone. You, what happened? Well, you didn't pay for it. That's what, you got your comeuppance is what it boils down to. Yeah, that's right. And so the book of Revelation is about how Jesus Christ, the righteous one, stays true in his righteousness and that this old world is going to get its comeuppance and Jesus is going to be honored and glorified. And this book is to give you more respect for the King of kings and Lord of lords, a better look at who Jesus really is in your life. It's not just a book about the future. It's a book that calls you to respect and honor Jesus Christ who lives in your heart and to let you know that you have a champion that is living in you. You have a king, a diadem, one with a, not, not with a little winner's crown like Stephanos, like an Olympic trial crown that says, you did good, you won first place, but a diadem in the Greek, which means a crown of a king. Jesus is the king of this world and the king of our life and the king of our salvation. And the book of Revelation just pours it on and time after time shows you what a king is really all about and how this crazy world is leading to catastrophe and catastrophic results, and how the spirit that we see happening right now in this world. And I know some of you watch the news, and some of you get your news through Facebook, which is a dangerous thing. You know, fake news and all that. I can guarantee you, man, it's unbelievable. And, and no matter how you come down on what you think about politics or social life or whatever it might be, I, can make, I, I guarantee you I can make everybody in this room hate me and walk out if I just started quoting a few things because you, you have an opinion about stuff. And I don't, you know, it doesn't matter to me what your opinion is because I'm not up here to preach politics or, or, uh, or socialism or whatever it might be. I'm a representative of the King of Kings, and the chips fall where they may, all right? I'm not trying to insult you, and I don't plan to insult you because you could be right. I mean, come on, you know? I don't know everything, and neither does anybody sitting in this room. Only Jesus knows, and the Spirit of God knows, and what I'm intended to do is basically call attention to whatever it is that the Holy Spirit can use to challenge you to hear what God says in these days and not to be seduced and, and overcome with this spirit of the age because I guarantee you that spirit is intended to suck you in and intended to cause you to fall victim to these, this craziness that's happening in preparation of a world leader that's going to come in and be terribly, catastrophically uh, received by this world and leads this world in rebellion against the kingdom of God. And I'm sorry to say that that spirit that's going to be revealed and loosed as these seals are broken and these trumpets are blown and these vials are poured out is already alive on this earth today. I don't know who it is. I don't know where it is. But I would just about guarantee you that the leader of this world that will one day come and be that great uh, antichrist, you know, who will be a person, by the way. It's not just a spirit. It's a real person. But that person has most likely already been born on this earth. The little fellow's growing up somewhere. May even be a teenager by now. Might be a young adult. But one of these days, that person is going to be revealed because the Spirit of God is going to be removed from this earth. And that Spirit restrains that person, holds that person back, keeps that person from being revealed too early. But one of these days, the Holy Spirit is going to be withdrawn as a restrainer, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just read it yourself. You don't even have to be a preacher to understand what it says. And that restrainer is going to be re removed, and then that 
lawless one is what, is what is he's referred to. He is the lawless one. Man, you can't look at life today and say, buddy, we're not experiencing lawlessness. Good night, man. Every day on whatever screen you watch or whatever uh, uh, environment you read, you have to admit lawlessness is going berserk today. Whether it's some crowds chanting at some political event, whether it's somebody standing outside a restaurant and harassing people and, you know, giving them problems because of what they believe, whether it's some kind of a movement that is supposed to uh, come against uh, the, the authorities of law in the land, whether some craziness that uh, around the world that you look at and go, man, these people are just out of their minds, whether it's stuff that has to do with immigration and with uh, laws of the land. You just see a spirit of anarchy, a spirit of lawlessness. Well, what is that? Well, let me tell you, that is predicating the master lawless one that is coming, and we see it on this earth today. And it's going to get worse, and it's going to get tremendously bad when that restrainer is pulled out of the way. I mean, you only see in the little four glimmerings of lawlessness. And the more you see it every day, the more it ought to remind you of what this old crazy world is going to be about when the Holy Spirit is removed out of this earth. In other words, I'm saying we're in the four glimmerings of it. As these seals are broken, these seals represent basically a removal of the restraint. Things that are already alive on this earth right now. Things that are happening right now. Things that you can see in the news. Things that you can experience in your neighborhood. Things that happen to, in your own home are, are reflections of these, of these spirits that when the seals begin to be broken... They just, they just loose it in an unrestrained way. So every day when you live, you can be reminded of what's coming on this earth and that Jesus says, you need me. <laughs> yeah, I'm here for you. Come on, before it's too late, open your life. Get the king in your life. Uh, live triumphantly in your life because I have a pattern, I have a plan, I have a future, I, there's prophecy, and this world is headed for a terrible, cataclysmic, uh, whew, disastrous end. And so as every one of these seals are broken, things just get worse and worse. And so we find ourselves now in the middle of chapter 6 of Revelation, and we have had four of these seals that have been broken already. Just as, as a reminder... And I know you don't really need any reminder because you obviously re remember everything I've said. I mean, I, this is obvious to me. But, so I don't want to insult you, but just as a, as a reminder, we've had four seals that have been broken in the first uh, eight verses of this chapter. And the first one was the white seal, which released uh, the spirit of Antichrist. It's not the Antichrist. It's not a person that's revealed on a white horse. It's a spirit that's revealed. According to what John says about the fourth seal, we have to look at these seals not as people but as uh, things, as uh, happenings on this earth. Because the fourth seal, you remember, he said the rider on the black horse or the pale horse is called death, and hell follows with him. So he's identifying, all right, when you start looking at these horsemen, don't look at, for a person, look for a spirit, look for, look for a, 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 a something that's happening on this earth. So the white horse is the spirit of Antichrist. It's that, it's that nature that we have in us to, 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 to go against the things of God. And, and so when that white horse is revealed, the first one, boy, the spirit of Antichrist just gets out of control on this earth which is not hard for us to imagine since we already see it alive right now. The only difference is it's going to get way worse because the restrainer is going to be taken out of the way. Then the red horse comes forth next, and the red horse has the power to take away peace from the earth. I don't know if you've noticed it now, but all over the world, yeah. the cry is for peace over this world. Yeah. We're so worried about Iran. We're so worried about North Korea. 
We're so worried about the Chinese. We're so worried about uh, all of these entities, you know, in Syria and Afghanistan and the, the hordes of Pakistan. And we're in the news every day. There just seems to be a tremendous worry and concern about people who are not wanting to be peaceful in this world. Well, you know, when the little dictator from North Korea started shooting rockets up in the air, everybody got all bent out of shape. Why? Well, how can we have peace whenever this guy's doing all these terrible things? Or the, the pact with Iran, you know, and they keep trying to develop nuclear weapons even though they say they're not. Why, why are we all worried about that? Why are we fearful about that? Well, it's because this earth is filled with a spirit that is crying peace and safety. We don't want to worry about these rogue issues, and we're wanting peace and safety. And 2 Thessalonians says that it is not wars and rumors of wars that we should be worried about because they have always happened on this earth. And Jesus said it in Matthew 24, don't worry about wars and rumors of wars because they have always been here. But when men shall cry peace and safety, that's one of the signs that the whole world is just consumed with this peace and safety stuff all over the world. But when the rider of the red horse comes, the Bible says he's given the power to take peace from this earth. And what is it that takes peace from this earth? Fear takes peace from this earth. Terror brings peace from, breaks peace from this earth. Every time one of these people that are filled with a spirit of Antichrist blow up themselves in a bomb somewhere, it makes the world fearful. And it says, how can we have peace? We don't even know when it's going to happen. And then riots break out and anarchy is flourishing everywhere. It's just unbelievable how fearful and chaotic this world we live in. And the red horse is going to give the ability to take, to make us worry even more. Boom. And it's unrestrained. The third horse that rides forth is the black horse, and the black horse carries some scales in his hand. And these are scales that weigh out measurement like grain, you know, and a, a spirit from the throne, which is probably the voice of Jesus or the voice of the Father. It says it comes from the throne, and it says, you know, uh, a measure of wheat, uh, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. Uh, three quarts of barley for a day's wages, but don't touch the oil or the wine, which is clearly the introduction of famine times. It is the introduction of scarcity and that the common man is going to get beat up once again. Most of us, I think, would identify ourselves as common people, uh, you know, that we're the working man, we're blue collar. Uh, we live by day by day. Uh, we have to be careful how we spend and what we spend on. And, and so we're the working men of life. And this rider of the third horse, the black horse, just basically says, everybody that lives day to day, get ready because you're going to really get ravished when this black horse comes forth because the oil and the wine are the, are the, uh, 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 are the oh, what word am I looking for? It are the, the niceties of life. Therefore, the, the oil and the wine are, are the upper crust things of life. They're the, they're the, 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 the scarcities of life. They're going to do fine. I don't know how many of you are made mad by this, and by mad I mean angry. Uh, when it looks like the, you know, the rich people don't ever have to suffer. They always seem to come out on top. But us working people have to worry about how our bills are going to get paid, and, 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 and they're going to come, they'll put us under the jail for some stuff that they seemingly get away with. That there are t two sets of laws in this country, the laws for the haves and the laws for the have-nots. And because we're the have-nots, we always get dumped on. We always get held to a higher standard, and they can just seemingly get away with anything. Well, this breaking of the third seal says that it's going to get worse than that. It's going to become a day when you are going to have to work a whole day just to buy enough food to support yourself for a day. A quart of wheat is how much it takes to keep an average person alive not prospering, not flourishing, not, you know, healthy, but just keep you alive. That's how much it takes, a quart of wheat a day 
for you personally to have your needs met. Not to meet your needs and your family and your children and your loved ones, but just you. And so this rider of the third horse has some scales that say, you're going to have to work for a day's wages just to keep yourself alive. And if you want to take a little, uh, uh, barley's considered the poor man's wheat, which just means barley, you can live off of it, but it takes three times as much to support you as it does one quart of wheat, three quarts of barley. So you can, you can divide it up and you can buy the cheaper stuff if you want to, you know, go down to Walmart or wherever you might go or people market or whatever it might be where you can get the discounted stuff and you can buy that if you want to, but it, even though you have more stuff, it's going to take more of it to keep you alive so you hadn't gained anything. I'm just saying, forget about the power bill, forget about your car note, forget about your mortgage on your house. Uh, you're going to have to pay everything you make in order to stay alive, just you by yourself. That's what's coming on this earth at the breaking of the third seal when this rider with the scales in his hands come forth. So if you're made mad by, I'm mad, I mean angry, by the diversity of life right now, you just ain't seen nothing yet. You better give your heart to the Lord. You look at the person beside you and say, you better get saved. I'm serious, man. You, you, you ain't going to like it if you get into this stuff now. It's just going to get more and more horrible. It's terrible for you, and you're going to see it more and more. And you know, and I think one of the tortures of the black horse is that uh, you're going to begin to feel this more and more. I'm already, I, I, you can get me fired up in a heartbeat by, by pointing out the uh, disparity of the haves and the have-nots. Boy, it's going to get even worse when the black horse comes forth and it's unrestrained. Now see, you see what I'm talking about? All three I've described so far, we're already seeing the four glimmerings of that. That's already on this earth. So every time you see this on Facebook, TV, Twitter, wherever you get your news from, every time you see an example of this, you can just say, uh-huh, that's what Jesus said was going to happen right there. And so it just it gives you, it gives you a, a, another look at the veracity of the Word of God. God is saying this 2,000 years ago, guys. This book was written in, in, in like 90 A.D. We are in 2018 A.D. And the words that were written in a, uh, before 100 A.D. prophetically are now, we're beginning to see these things. And, and it just says the Word of God knows what it's talking about. I mean, my goodness. And he wants you to say, all right, I see what's happening. And bless God, it's doing just like you said you're doing, which ought to give you some comfort to know who's really in control of this stuff. God is in control. This is no reason to fear the only reason you should fear is if you don't know the Lord. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't know the Lord, this is you. You're going to be here when these horses get uh, trump, trumpet forth out of the, the cosmos. And then the last horse is a pale horse, like a light green horse, and you like the, the color of death. We could call him the cadaverous horse or the pale horse. It looks like somebody died and they kind of have paled out and greened out what it's called, the Bible, that's the color that's mentioned. We just call it the pale horse for lack of a better term for it. And when this pale horse comes forth, death is riding it and hail's driving the hearse. Death kills people and, hearse sco and, 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 and hell scoops them up, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh my Lord. Crazy martyrdom, crazy killing, crazy death like we're already seeing. I know, look, guys, we don't, even, we don't even know what's happening in places around this world with Christians, with believers. If you did a search and you, you just typed in, you know, uh, Christian martyrdom 2018 or 2017 or 2016, whatever date you want to put in there, you would see horrific things. You would see people march to open graves and shot or killed or gassed or whatever it might be. And their only crime is they are they're Christians, much less other people that are sacrificed by these whacked out dictators that think they're God. I mean, it's just craziness in this world. And the fourth seal says it's going to get worse. But we already see that spirit alive right now. And so as the fifth seal is, sound, is broken, let's see what else happens. And when he opened the fifth seal, 
I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, everybody, in, and when I say everybody, I'm talking about Bible teachers and so forth, talk about these people as being martyrs. Now, even though the word is not their martyr, uh, what they're being killed for is the fact that they somehow know the Lord. They somehow uh, have a testimony of things that are contrary to the spirit of this age that we live in. And these souls were seen under the altar. We'll talk about that in a second. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who, are, who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed, as they were, was completed. And I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Boy, that is chaotic, isn't it? Woo! And the kings of the earth. Look, seven groups of people here. Which one might you fall into? Look at them. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, Every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? The fifth and sixth seals are broken and catastrophic events begin to be broken loose on this earth that affect the peace of the earth, the fear of the earth, the complexity of the earth, and boy, things just get worse and worse and worse. You say, man, how much worse could it get? I know you're sitting there probably saying, you've probably said it before in the last weeks or two or whatever. You, how much worse could it get? Well, let me just say, it can get a lot worse than it is now. And according to the Bible, this is what happens as the fifth seal. Remember, the fourth seal is the death and hell. And then there's the breaking of the fifth seal. And the fifth seal represents souls under the altar, which are brutal persecutions that begin to happen in these days after, after the coming of Christ for his own. The rapture is what we call it. That word just means upgathering, taken away. Chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation, John is called up in the Spirit into heaven so that he could be shown what shall be hereafter. All the events represent the church being already there before these things are being taken away. Church never mentioned after chapter 4 until right at the end of the book when it just kind of surmises everything. So we're, 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 we're viewing this along with John. John represents us. John represents the believers. And we're looking at these things just like John. And we're looking at the earth. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're on the earth for looking down and seeing a, a white horse and a red horse and a black horse and a pale horse. And we're going, oh, my goodness, look at the earth. And it's just rocking and reeling and rolling. And then all of a sudden, when he breaks the fifth seal, our attention's called back to heaven. And when we get to, and when we, in heaven, we're looking in it, describes, and when he opened the fifth seals, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And so we're, we're brought back to heaven, and in heaven, we see the altar. Now, you know, I don't want to strain in a gnat and swallow a camel, and I know a lot of times... Uh, that means, you know, you can get too monotonous and too minute in what you're trying to see that it just gets out of whack. But I just want to call your attention to one, one little thought by looking at, at, at this group that is described being under the altar, that the article that's used there about the altar is the altar, not just an altar. In other words, when John describes it and the Spirit, you know, uh, speaks to John and lets John see it, John says, uh, uh, I'm talking about the altar. 
not just an altar, but the altar, as if everybody who, to whom he was writing would be so uh, knowledgeable about the altar that they would know which altar he's talking about. The altar. What altar might this be? Well, I, I just want to go back to the book of Leviticus because I, I know you're, you know, you say, what, what are you talking about this, the altar? Well, in the book of Leviticus, uh, some altars are described that the Jewish people would become very familiar with. These are altars that were used in the tabernacle when Moses went through the wilderness to, do, to sacrifice the things of God and to receive the, you know, the uh, forgiveness for one year. And then you had to come back next year and do the same thing and the next year and do the same thing. And it just sh showed a sacrifice that Jesus was going to be the complete fulfillment of. But, but look at the instruments that are used here in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of the sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting. Now, let's just stop there a second. Let me give you a little brief description. In the tabernacle, there was an outer court, fenced in, had a big brazen altar right here before you went in to a, another place that is called the tabernacle of meeting, which is just a little room that people could, after they made their sacrifice outside, if God accepted it, then they could go into this little uh, inner court, and in this little inner court, there was an altar of incense, you know, and there were other pieces here that, you know, candlestick and so forth, and they were brought in there, and they could go in there, and it was called the, you know, the place of meeting, and then on the other side, there was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and you didn't go in there because God would kill you if you went in there, so... You know, anyway, the only person ever got to go in the Holy of Holies was the high priest, and he went in there one time a year. And when he went in there, he had the blood of uh, all the people that had been confessed sins, and he better hope he was right, because if he went in that Holy of Holies and this blood wasn't confessed over and the sins weren't forgiven, you know, he, 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 God would kill him. I mean, good night. Who would want this job? This wouldn't be, this wouldn't be a job you applied for, right? It was said about the high priest that he wore a garment that had little bells that jingled on the bottom when he walked. And the reason why is so if uh, the bell stopped jingling, it would be like, uh-oh, uh, well, the priest is dead up in there. Now, the question was, who's going to go up in there and drag him out? I mean, you know, I, what I want to know, it wasn't, no, 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 no. So uh, legend says that he had a chain around his ankle, so if God killed him, they could drag him up out of there without having to go, you know, go up in there and be killed himself. But the point is, the point is, I mean, for, for, for centuries, this is, uh, the, the, the Jew, this is the way the Jewish people sacrificed. They would come in and they would hang a, they'd hang a, a bull or a goat on the, on the horns of the brass altar, which was outside, which is this next one, and he shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Now, I'm just saying this because I, I want you to get a, you know, a picture of this. Is your salvation is not riding on it, but I, I, you might be interested in what this is saying to you, really. What it's saying to you is that there is an altar outside of the tent. The first thing you come to when you come into the uh, tabernacle or the temple of God, there's a big brass big brass altar outside that is called the brazen or the brass altar, and it had horns and hooks on it, and you hung your sacrifice up there, and your blood dripped down onto the coals, and the, you know, the smoke from that blood went up, and it went up into the nostrils of God, and if God accepted it, great, it meant you were good. If he didn't, you got to go back outside and get your family to confess for the rest of you know, who's lying about this? I mean, look, I'm going in there as the dad of the family, and I'm going to have to stand before God and say, these are the sins of my family, and this is the blood that sacrificed to cover the sins of my family. And, you know, if it, you know legend said, and I, I heard this. It's so funny. In Christ of the Ozarks, I went to a, a little meeting. They had some little replicas of things, and they had an old Jewish rabbi that was teaching about the tabernacle and so forth. And he said that according to Jewish legend, that as that smoke ascended up out of that brazen altar, the smoke just went kind of straight up when you drip that blood on hot coals, it created smoke, and that smoke went up like this. And, 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 and legend, according to the Jewish people, was that, that as that smoke went up, that, that, that it was like God breathed in like this. And if that smoke began to move and go into the nostrils of God, it meant everything was fine and God accepted that sacrifice, and you were now clean for the next year. If that smoke didn't 
go into the nostrils of God. It meant you got to run outside as the daddy of the family and you got to start, get your family together and say, all right, who didn't come clean? All right, who, hey, who's who? You didn't tell me everything, right? All right, you know, we got to, now we got to not only go back in there, but we got to wait till the end of the line because all this stuff had to happen in one day. I mean, you didn't get a second chance, really. It was, I mean, you got, you didn't get to go right back in because your family lied to you and didn't confess all their sins. No, you had to wait at the end, and if you didn't make it in, they cast you out, and that meant you were out in the desert by yourself, which means you and your family were going to die. They wouldn't have anything to do with you again. You couldn't eat their food. You couldn't travel with them. You, you were on your own, man, which means you were a dead man in the desert if you were on your own. This was serious. Look at your neighbor like, this is serious stuff. Man, this meant your family, your, poster, your posterity, your future was in the hands of the fact that everybody confessed everything and that you could be made clean. Well, that brass altar is the altar where blood dripped. When the blood dripped, the priest would take a little bit of that blood, go through a little tent flap into the inner court, and, and he would go over to this altar that stood right before this big giant uh, curtain that kept the Holy of Holies separated from this inner court, and it had a little piece of furniture on it about like this, and it had f a gold crown on top, and it had four little gold horns, one on each corner like this, and he would take some of that blood, and he would put a little bit on the tip of that one, tip of that one, tip of that one, tip of that one, and then he would take a little bit, and he would drip it on these little uh, uh, incense deals, which is wood with oil uh, incense in it, and, and then that would kind of begin to to go up and that, that little incense would create a little cloud of smoke and that would fragrance and it would be sweet smelling and all of that kind of stuff. And so the altar, the altar, I think is the brazen altar that you see right there in Leviticus 4. In other words, when John says, let me show you what's happening in heaven, he said, there's an altar there. There's a brass altar. And underneath that brass altar, there are some people just like in the Old Testament, they would take all of that excess blood. You say, man, what would happen to all the blood in a bull? What would happen to all the blood? I mean, you're talking about like little fingertips to sprinkle here and sprinkle there and sprinkle there and sprinkle there. I mean, you weren't talking about the complete capacity of the blood of an entire sacrifice. Man, that thing was drained, and how many you know, gallons of blood would it be? And so what they would do is take the excess blood, and they would pour it under the altar. So there are some souls that are seen under the altar. You know what the blood did in the Old Testament days? It was a sacrifice. So John is saying, just like the blood represented or showed sacrifice in the Old Testament, these people are sacrificed for what? Well, according to the verse, they're sacrificed for their testimony for Christ. Why were they killed? Why, why were they under the altar when you look back in heaven? Why were they not part of, that, of those elders? And why were they not part of the group that John represented? It's because these people were killed during the tribulation in order you know, for their salvation. And let me just explain it this way. There are going to be some people that come to the Lord during the tribulation. I know that the Holy Spirit has moved off this earth and is no longer restraining, but the Holy Spirit is still obviously convicting because there are going to be many people that come to the Lord during the tribulation. And I know you may be foolishly thinking like some I've come across who foolishly think, well, all right, praise God, brother. You know, hey, man, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to wait till then to get saved because, you know, I'll know all this stuff you're preaching about is true. Because you right now may be sitting here going, man, this is the most outlandish Star Wars stuff I've ever heard in my life. You're thinking, how in the world could anybody believe this stuff, you know? And I'm telling you, if I, if I see all this stuff start to happen on the earth, then I'll know you're telling the truth and I'll go, well, that old man had it right. I might need to get right with God. Well, let me just tell you why I think it's foolish for you to think this way. There are two reasons. Number one is, in the book of 2 Thessalonians, it says, if you've had an opportunity on this side of the, the great gathering up of God, the rapture, 
and you had an opportunity to receive the truth and know the truth and believe the truth, and if you're, if you're foolish enough not to do it right now, and you've been presented with the truth, that when, 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 when we're taken away, you are not going to have another chance. Now, other people who've never heard and never had an opportunity and have never been convicted, they're going to have a chance. It's going to be at a great price, however, because it's going to mean their life. They're not only going to, I mean, they're going to come to Christ. You say, how do people come to Christ in the tribulation? Same way you come to Christ right now. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How are you saved now? If you'll confess in your heart that Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, Romans says, and you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Same way you get saved. But the only difference is they are going to do that at the, at the, at the, at the sentence of death to their life. So even though you may think, man, I'll just wait till the tribulation, I'll get saved, I'm going to tell you, no, you're not. Because you've heard it, right? Sorry to inform you. Your presence in this place has now eliminated you from the group that has the possibility to be saved because 2 Thessalonians says, and God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie because when they had an opportunity to receive the truth, they rejected the truth because they loved their sin more than they loved God. Now, I'm not paraphrasing those verses. That's exactly what they say. Second reason I think you're foolish is because you can't tell me if you don't have a cur enough courage right now and fortitude right now to stand up and say, I want Christ in my life and to walk down this aisle and say, I want Jesus in my life when nobody's going to persecute you for doing that. Don't tell me you're going to be courageous enough whenever it means your life to do that. You walk down in this period that we're talking about now and it's going to be sudden death for you, buddy. It's going to be, you're, not, you're going to confess the Lord, but it's going to be at the cost of your life because if you think the Antichrist is going to allow you to walk around chirping about Jesus, you got another thing coming. You talk about hatred of Christianity now in this crazy world we live in. Boy, when the Holy Spirit's restraint is removed from this earth, you ain't seen nothing yet. So these souls under the altar are poured out like blood under the altar, which is meaning they are sacrificed, and they are under the altar. And I want you to notice something else about them. John can see who they are. They're not just some kind of ethereal spirits out there floating around. They're not some kind of cosmic puffs of wind underneath the altar. John said they were souls. They were people. I saw them. I could tell that they were people. I know who they are. This is a generation of people that come out of tribulation. Look, in chapter 7, the whole chapter is about these people. He's going to tell you who they are, where they are, what happened to them, and all of that kind of stuff. So let me just move on because, I mean, it's time for us to stop. It, it usually is always time for us to stop. I want to show you one thing that I think you might be interested in that will help you, and this is just kind of one of those things that gives you a... Uh, the, the concept of the authority of the Word of God. J just so you'll know this, I think it'll help you. I think it'll be encouraging in your spirit. Let me just show this to you. When Jesus was on this earth, Jesus uh, talked about end-time things. How many of you know this? You know this? All right. Jesus didn't spare talking about how things were going to be at the, end of t at the end of the age. And one of the great places that Jesus tells us what's going to happen is in Matthew chapter 24. The book of Matthew is written to Jewish people to tell them that Jesus is their king, their Messiah, and that they should love him and serve him. The book of Matthew is filled with Jewish stuff. If you've ever read the book of Matthew, it talks about the temple. It talks about the holy days. It talks about the festivals of the Jews. It gives us some pictures of the Sanhedrin and the inner workings of the temple and all that. In other words, Matthew is a very Jewish book. It has lots of Jewish things because it was written to show that Jesus is king of the Jews and to help the Jews receive Jesus as their Messiah. So in the book of Matthew on chapter 24, Jesus is questioned by his disciples. You do recognize that his disciples were Jews, right? Jesus is a Jew and his disciples are Jews. 
So when you get questioned by Jewish people and they ask you a question, are you going to tell them what's happening to everybody or are you just going to tell them what's happening to Jews? Well, the only thing that's important is, let me tell you what's going to happen to Jews on this earth. So here's what's going to happen on this earth. And what I want you to see is how what Jesus said corresponds exactly with what Revelation says in the breaking of these first six seals. Look at it. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, this is Matthew 24. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. So they've been, they've been uh, saying, Okay, Jesus, you've been talking about the end of the age and you're coming and blah, blah. When is that going to happen? And here's what Jesus said. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. That's a description of what happens with the white horse, the spirit of Antichrist. He says, let me tell you, the first thing that's going to happen is there's going to come a spirit that's going to try to deceive you into thinking it's Christ, but don't be deceived by that. The second thing he says, next verse, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. There is seal two, the rider on the red horse, the spirit of terror. The third thing Jesus says is, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines. So Jesus is talking about, hey, the next seal is going to be the black horse. Look at what he said. And then the next verse, well, right in the middle, starting after famines, the next words are pestilences and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. There's your pale horse, the spirit of death that has four weapons. You remember the four weapons? Famines, disasters, uh, plagues on this earth, and wild beasts. <laughs> yeah death in all kinds of ways. And then the next verse five, or seal five, verse nine, then they shall deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. In other words, he tells the Jews, you're going to be dead men in those days. People are going to hate you. People are going to kill you. You know, there's in this world, he said, you're going to have tribulation. So don't let it surprise you that you're going to be hated for my name's sake and there's going to come a day when people that kill you think they're doing God a favor. And so he's describing these martyrs under the seal. This is the, the fifth seal. And then in the sixth seal, he says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Let me just ask you, is the lawlessness of this day affecting you in any way? Is it making you harder is it making you more withdrawn from, you know, the, 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 the closeness? I don't know about you, but I get mad every day. As a matter of fact, Tanya will not let me watch the news in the morning. No, because every time and then when, when she comes back in there and I'm sitting there drinking some coffee, I am just mad as a hornet. I'm just really, whoo! The lawlessness of these days and the unrighteousness of these days just makes me boil. Well, the Bible says that lawlessness is going to do that to us. It makes the love of us grow cold, and then we are able to have a spirit that will treat people anyway. But see, Jesus is talking about these six seals. I thought you might be interested in that. Jesus said that. And, and then in verse 10 of Revelation uh, 6, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? They're not saying, Are you going to do it? They say, How long is it going to be? Because well, there's no question as to whether God's going to avenge. It's just a matter of how long it's going to be. And his answer in verse 11, then he took a white robe and he gave it to him. In other words, the first thing Jesus did when they asked his question, how long is it going to be? He said, come here, man. Let me come. Come over here. Let me comfort you. And he puts this white robe on him and he comforts him. And then he tells them, uh, it's going to be a little while, guys, because there are going to be a lot of more people. There are going to be a lot, a lot of more. There are going to be... Lots more people just like you who have to be killed. In other words, the tribulation is going to be filled with a lot of people that get killed. And so I, I'm going to wait a little while so that the people that are going to be killed like you and the brethren like you that are going to be killed, I'm going to wait until all of it gets together, and then I'm going to just get them in one fell swoop, all right? In other words, Jesus said, hey, they have, their comeuppance is coming. But just be patient, wait a little bit, let me give you a little comfort, and, and it's going to happen. And of course, the rest of the book is about that. Then the sixth seal is broken and blind panic takes over the earth. I'm going to hit this real quick, 
And I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon like blood. And I'm just saying that the natural events of this earth, you know, you know, what, you know what the sixth seal is intended to do? Create chaos and fear. Oh, this world's already filled with fear, right? How many of you, how many of you, <laughs> this is so ridiculous, it's kind of funny, but how many of you have uh, been taught to believe that the greatest thing we need to fear on this earth is uh, climate issues? Yeah, climate issues. I mean, some of, the, some of the countries of the world says, you know what the greatest problem we face? Terrorism. Nope. Uh, immigration overwhelm. Uh, no. Uh, the failure of our money. Uh, no. Uh, being attacked by another country. Uh, nope. Uh, Iran getting nuclear missiles and, you know, the little man from Korea shooting at us. Uh, no. The greatest thing we have to fear is this earth getting like a half a degree warmer over the next 500 years. That's the biggest thing we need to be scared of. Craziness, right? Well, Jesus said, you think, you, think, you think climate chaos is something to be afraid of? Let me tell you, when we break this sixth seal, you know what's going to happen on the earth? There's going to be something that rattles this whole planet. And when it rattles, I'm not talking about some little eight point something or nine point something or some little, little jiggle somewhere. I'm talking about a cataclysmic shaking of this earth. And when it does, it's going to send up, it's going to send up uh, smoke and debris into this world so severe it's going to blacken out the sun. Now, we already see stuff like this. You let the earth belt one time. I mean, it doesn't even have to blow up. Just let a volcano somewhere just burp one time. And when that thing burps, it pops up soot and smoke and ash, goes up into the atmosphere, begins to be caught by the jet stream or whatever and circle around Earth, and it gets colder here than it's been. You know, when Mount St. Helens did this up in the state of Washington, it affected our weather for how long? Years. And, they did, and, and Mount St. Helens just belched a burp. Yeah, acid reflux of the Earth. Jesus said, let me tell you something. Whenever this sixth seal's broken, buddy, things are going to break loose and this earth's going to rattle and smoke's going to send up and the sun's going to be blackened out. Boy, you're talking about scared to death. This is going to create chaos and fear in this old world like you've never seen. And then the moon, when you look at the moon at night and it's covered by this blackness, it's going to look like blood. It's going to turn red. I mean, it's gonna, you, when you see it, it's going to look red like blood. And then he says, and you know what's going to happen after that? And the stars of the heaven fell to the earth. Everybody say, uh, meteors and comets. Yeah, our earth is surrounded by a shield. I know you know this, an ozone layer. And if you could see this earth uh, in any kind of a, uh, a view from space, you would see like ping, 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 ping. Some of you say, boy, I saw a shooting star. No, you didn't. What you saw was a meteor hit our atmosphere and be burned up. Because our atmosphere annihilates these things before they hit the earth. But now you've got an earth and it's quaked and, the, and it's blackened out and it's affected the layers and blah, blah. Now these things that bombard these asteroids, these meteors, these comets, these things that are reflected out and bling, 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 bling by our ozone. Now all of a sudden these things fly through here and go boom, hit the earth, boom, hit the earth, boom, hit the earth. Like, like, like atomic bombs and nuclear bombs uh, magnified a thousand times. It's just pew, everywhere, boom. And it just, it just cataclysmic things begin to affect the earth. And man, fear is just rampant and chaos and anarchy. And it's just, uh, whoo, it's so, it's so amazing that this earth just falls into complete chaos and anarchy. And it affects everybody. And he just make us know that. It said, and the kings, uh, here, he, it lists seven groups of people. The only thing I want you to know is all of these are under the same judgment. Look, the kings of the earth. And I put in your notes who the kings of the earth are. They're the heads of the government. They're the kings, the potentates, the papas, the pro parliamentarians, the presidents, the, the, the kings of the earth, okay? These kings, man, they're shaking in their boots. And the great men, 
The great men are probably heads of state or heads of the government, like the senators, the congressmen, the parliamentarians, the proletariat members, uh, the people that occupy high positions in government, the rich men, the men who feel like they can tell us what to do and they have enough money to make sure it doesn't happen to them. You can hear those jokers cackling nowadays, telling us, the little working men, how we ought to learn to suffer. You know why they say that? Because they don't think it's going to happen to them. They think their money's going to save them. They think they have enough money not to be touched like we are. I could go down a list as long as my arm of people that are commenting all the time about how we ought to be and believe and think and all that because they don't think they're going to be touched by this. But the Bible says you don't have enough money to escape this. You rich men are going to be just like everybody else. And the commanders, these are the heads of army and the mighty men. The mighty men are those people who think they're better than everybody else. Yeah, that's right. Watch it on TV. You'll see them. Yeah, they talk every day about the craziness and wackiness trying to tell us what to do and how to believe. They think they know everything. They think they're too big to be touched and that they're smarter than everybody else. Jesus said, you're not smart enough not to be touched by this. And those that are enslaved. Enslaved people are just people who think they're so insignificant that it's not going to matter about them. But this verse says it doesn't matter how insignificant you think you are. You're not so insignificant as to escape the judgment of God. And free men, free men just mean people who think they can live their own life and they're the masters of their own destiny and they're the saviors of their own soul and they have the right to make decisions that affect their lives. And the, and the Bible says, no, you ain't met the master yet. You'll meet him here one day. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us. So they're scared to death. They're trembling in their boots. They find out, finally find out who the master is. And what are they calling on the mountains and the rocks to hide them from? I'm going to say this quickly now so y'all relax. I'm not 45 minutes more. Just a minute. Let me give you this. What are they afraid of? Two things. Number one, the face of God. In other words, all of a sudden now, they've come face to face with the one who sits on the throne. Everybody say they're looking at God's face. God's face just simply means they finally realize there is a God. You know, there are people who actually don't believe there's a God. There are atheists on this earth. They say they are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, they're crazy people like... You know, you, you don't believe, I mean, come on, man. You, you can't believe there's not a God. Yes, I do. You can't believe that. Yes, I do. Uh, you can't believe that. Swear to God, I do. You know, I mean. Yeah, you know. There are people who say that, but they're, they're going to be long gone by this time. <laughs> there's going to be nobody on earth who doesn't believe in God because they're going to be afraid. Why? Because they're, they're looking at the mountains and say, kill us, fall on us, rocks, hide us from what? The face of God. There's not going to be anybody that doesn't recognize at this point that there is a God in heaven and he's causing this and they want to hide and have the mountains fall on them and kill them to keep them away and hide them from the terror of the face of God. There are no atheist in these days. And the second thing is, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, this is paradoxical, isn't it? I mean, really. A paradox is something that should be the exact opposite of what it appears, just by the way, just a simple little thought about that. Uh, but uh, it's paradoxical that they would hide from the Lamb. I mean, there, is there any more gentle lamb, uh, animal on the face of the earth than a lamb? Why would people be afraid of a lamb? You know, I think it is because Jesus is looked at as a gentle lamb that people think that they can ignore Jesus right now and that eventually everybody, Jesus is the gentle lamb, so everybody's eventually going to go to heaven when they die. So people right now, I think, uh, falsely believe that no matter how they live, somehow the gentle lamb of God is going to allow them in someday. But according to this verse, the gentle lamb is going to be uh, scary. <laughs> the rat, uh, hey, what's worse than a nuclear exposure, explosion? What's worse than a hydrogen bomb? What's worse than uh, 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 weapons of mass destruction? Well, it must, be, it must be the face of the Lamb of God 
because they're so scared. And then this verse ends with one big question. Let me just ask you this question. And who's going to be able to stand? Who's going to be able to stand? That's the question of the universe after the sixth seal is, and who's going to be able to stand against it? Let me just say this to you. The only people that can stand in the presence of God are those who stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Nobody unclothed in the righteousness of Christ would ever be able to stand in the presence of God. So the question then becomes to us at the end of the sixth seal, are we able to stand? Are you going to be able to stand in the presence of God? If God, it, it, now this is not going to happen, but let's just say that for, for just a, a illustration's sake, you die, you go to heaven, you stand before God, and God says, why should I let you in heaven? What would you say? Well, I did good stuff, God. Ah, out. Well, I tried to live right out. Well, I, you know, I gave my money and I tried to be a good friend, out. I was a great neighbor and I didn't treat people wrong and I did tried not to lie, out. The only answer that you could give is, why should I let you in heaven? And you can say, because I'm covered with the blood of the Lamb. I have asked Christ, come. that's the only answer. And I'm going to ask you, are you able to stand in the presence of God? Have you opened your life and received the Lord? There's some terrible things that are coming. This is not a pretty picture, is it? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the people that say, boy, I'm going to party and I'm going to be in hell. I'm going to, woo, I'm going to have a good time. I'm, I'm just looking at you and say, hey, read this and party on, man, you know. <laughs> Sounds like great times to me. How about you? No, I want to miss this. Do you, I mean, is this something that God would, would spare us from, that we would not go through this? If you've never received him in your heart, boy, now would be a good time. Look at you and say, man, don't miss this. Look at your neighbor and say, don't miss this. Boy, this is a tremendous. This is tremendous. All right, stand to your feet, would you?